Good morning, church. Are you glad to be in the house of God this morning? Awesome. We're going to get ready to, to worship and uh, praise our King and glorify God. And I'm so glad to be here this morning. I'd like to welcome all our first-time visitors. I know that uh, we have Andrew and Lorna here. Where are you at, Andrew and Lorna? Raise your hand. There you go. There are visitors this morning. Uh, please make sure you say hello to them. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Also, any birthdays this morning or anniversaries? Jim's birthday again. And so uh, we want to make sure that I believe today is uh, today is Jim and Rini's and where are they at? No? Oh, there they are. Our brothers, Dan and Joni, are going to be, this is their last Sunday with us. They're all, they're both couples are going back home. So make sure we're going to miss them. Uh, we have to wait until they come again and before Christmas or something like that. Also, want to wish uh, this Wednesday, uh, there's a birthday celebration for Brother David. Raise your hand, David. It's his birthday this Wednesday. want to remind everybody about tonight's service. Uh, we will be co covering the mythology, mythology of the church. Thank you, whoever helped me there. Wednesday night, prayer, 6 p.m. Church, we're in a world of trouble if you know what's going on in the world. We want to continue to pray for Israel as well as this country and our leaders and so forth. Make sure you show up for Wednesday. Uh, it's very crucial and important that we pray. Amen. We have to be a praying church. And now I'm going to tell you something. Uh, we have to be the people that are seeking God for this nation, for our community, for our children. Our children are being attacked as well as families. And some, uh, I know that in Toronto, Canada, and those areas, they're already passing laws that you can't preach the gospel. But we're not that far behind. So we have to be a people of prayer, and we have to be a people that are bold to proclaim the gospel. Thursday, 9.30 a.m., men's. Upstairs, women's, downstairs, Bible study, and most importantly, well, everything's important. This Saturday is our men's fellowship. We will be having breakfast on that day. Somebody is going to be proclaiming the word of God or teaching us that morning. So men, I encourage you, women, wives, encourage your brothers, your husbands, to sign up in the foyer. We need to know how many people are here so we know exactly what to make. Um, and from this moment on, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Rick. It's another special day in, in this church. We get to uh, welcome in another new member, Jolene Slater. And to assist in that, I've asked Zach to come and you know, introduce as well is pray, and I can't think of anybody he's known her his whole life. <laughs> so, Jolene, would you come forward? <laughs> All right. So I'm excited here to uh, welcome my mom into membership today here at Bethany Bible Church. Uh, we... Uh, we believe strongly in church membership as we submit ourselves to the local elders that God has put over us as a church. We recognize that publicly and formally that God has uh, given authorities that are there whose duty it is to watch over our souls. And so membership is us publicly acknowledging that and coming into it. And so my mom, who raised me, brought me to church and did all that good stuff, she is coming into membership here this morning. So uh, I think this is the time for Rick to take over. Well, we do have this uh, membership commitment to go through. Just a matter. Having been born again by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and being justified on the ground of his shed blood and having confessed my faith before men, I do now in the presence of God in this assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into this commitment with my fellow members as one local portion of the body of Christ. I commit, therefore, by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in Christian love 
to strive for the advance of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, disciplines, and doctrines, and to contribute <coughs> cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the relief of its poor, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. I also commit to maintain family and personal devotions, to educate my children in God's word, to seek the salvation of my kindred and acquaintances. By the grace and power of God, as a stranger and pilgrim in this world, I commit to abstain from fleshly lusts and worldly practices that war against the soul, and to forsake all bitterness and wrath, anger and clamor, and evil speaking, and to be kind to my fellow Christians, tenderhearted, forgiving them even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven me. I further commit to watch over my fellow members in brotherly love, to remember them in prayer, and to help aid them in sickness and distress. Does this uh, reflect the, your commitment in your heart? Yes, it does. She says amen. Um, as far as the members and this body of believers, do you so also uh, confirm and, and welcome her into this local body of this church? Amen. And I'm, I'm not, yay, amen. Okay, we have one more item. We have this official membership certificate here. It says, this certifies that Jolene Slater has confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and has received unto full membership Bethany Bible Church on the fifth day of May in the year of our Lord, 2024. And it's even got my signature on it. So, I mean, Wow. Give this to you. And would you like to pray, pray for this? Father, thank you for another Lord's Day where we come together and worship with you. Thank you for my mother who was uh, faithful in uh, exposing me to the scriptures and to the people of God, and that I had that opportunity as much as I fought against it as a child, that I was still exposed to those truths that did work their way in over the time through the testimony of the scriptures and the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for faithful parents everywhere who raise up their children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Bless this morning as we go out from here, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We'll have the music team come up. Let us uh, stand with hymn number 75. Give glory to Jesus. All glory to Jesus. And remain standing afterwards, and Dave Dotson will come up and share scripture following this hymn. All glory to Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading this morning is from the book of Romans, and it's a particular passage that Paul reiterates many times on 
how we should live as Christians. <clears throat> One of the things that I personally had struggled with is merging the gulf between what I think and what I do. You know, uh, Solomon tells us in Proverbs, as a man thinketh, so is he. And so we're encouraged to think of holy things, to ponder those thoughts that were of Christ. And that's really the message that Paul is giving us in the scripture this morning. It's Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read the whole chapter because I think it's important for us to capture the entire message that he presents to us. Listen and give honor to God's word. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion of our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching or he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not, why, be not, do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no evil for evil. Have a regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge others, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we do come to you this morning in humble reverence, in understanding that what we think is what we are. Lord, you have given us a new mind. You have given us a new spirit. You have given us the spirit and the mind of Christ. I pray, Lord, that each of us here this morning can remember that as we go from this place back into the world that pressures us to be the mind of the world. Lord, help us to continue to be the mind of Christ. Grow in us that ever yearning desire for holiness. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to make us what you would want us to be and show us how you would have us live. We give you praise and glory in all these things. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have a series of songs here that are focusing on the beauty of our Lord and just spending some time in worshiping our Savior, our Lord and Savior. It begins with a beautiful Savior.
upon Jesus. Let's stand with this one. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. See you. 
our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Turn your eyes to the heavens. Our King will return for his home. Every knee will bow, every tongue will shout all glory to Jesus alone. To you we lift our eyes, Jesus, our glory and our prize. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Jesus, our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. All right. Good morning, church. We will be picking back up in Colossians chapter 2. With the goal of finishing this chapter this morning. Always good to have goals. All right. So, again, as a reminder of the main themes we're kind of dealing with as we make our way through the book of Colossians, uh, we are dealing with what Paul seems, or at least what Paul seems to be dealing with, is some kind of Greek, proto-Gnostic, dualistic heresy that is threatening the church in Colossae. All of those are really big words to mean that, these, that this heretical group seemed to think that anything physical was bad and anything spiritual was good, so you needed to retreat from the physical world and try to ascend into a higher spiritual um, understanding. Uh, nos, where we get the word nos, that word gnosis, it's kind of the idea, it's knowledge. And they were really big on the idea of like, we're this inner circle with, you know, we have a superior understanding, a spirit. You got to come in. You know, you know a little bit out there, but come into here. This was like the later Gnostics. And let us tell you more about these aeons and these different, and, and it, it's complicated what they, the fully developed version of Gnosticism believed. But as you see, as we go through here, Paul been making the point that Jesus is the God man, that God became man. He entered into his creation with a true physical body. And after entering into it, he died, but then resurrected to yet still a physical body, a tangible body. That, just, that Jesus' coming, his death, burial, and resurrection is not the casting off of the physical creation that God made and called good, but rather it is the reclaiming of it from sin and death. And so, in that, we've been working our way through, we, and last week in chapter 2, we spoke about Paul's uh, desire for the church, uh, the church in Colossae, as well as the one in Laodicea, that they would have full understanding of the mystery of God, which he says is Christ himself. He makes the point that any kind of mystery has already been revealed in the person of Christ, that it is now known because the God-man came. There's not more. The mystery was back in the prophets when they weren't told everything. They were just told a part. 
And now that Christ has come, the mystery has been revealed. It is in Christ that all knowledge and wisdom is to be found. And so as they received him as the God-man, of the, as the Lord of creation, so they were to walk in him that, because that was the way in which they would be They would live lives that are worthy, the kind of lives that bear the fruit of the Christian life, that they were not to be taken captive by philosophy and tradition, but rather they were to be joined with Christ. And in this joining with Christ, they would have life, which brings us to verse 13. If you guys will stand with me for the reading of God's word, we'll be reading down to the end of the chapter. Thus says the words of the living God, and you being dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him, having graciously forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He also has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them in him. Therefore, no one is to judge you in food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, going into detail about visions he has seen, being puffed up for nothing by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees, do not handle, nor taste, nor touch, which deal with everything destined to perish with use, which are in accordance with the commands and teachings of men, which are matters having, to be sure, a word of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence." Thus says the words of the living God. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for this revelation that we may know you and draw near to you through it. Lord, speak to your people through the scriptures today. May we be conformed further into the image of Christ and furthered in our sanctification. Lord, may your name be glorified and lifted high in the preaching here this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And so returning to the beginning of that section of verses we were reading, and you being dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him, having graciously forgiven us all our transgressions. So you were dead, and now you are alive. That is the word here for the Christian here. You were dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh. And again, we kind of talked about the ideas of spiritual circumcision last week, the idea that, you know, uh, the, uh, the concept in the New Testament, we have Paul in other places saying that uh, a true Jew is not one who is one outwardly, but inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. And so you have this concept of this inward circumcision that is necessary, and without it, you are dead. And if, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that, uh, you were, that they were dead in their sins and trespasses. And I, I, this really needs to be stated here because here's something to understand about your situation before Christ. You were not merely sick. You did not just need some medicine. You couldn't get yourself out of this by, you know, taking the right supplements. You didn't need a, you weren't drowning in the ocean needing a life preserver. You were dead and a bloated corpse at the bottom of the sea. You were the valley of dry bones. That you were just sitting there dead. There's nothing in you and there's nothing you can do. You can't bring yourself to salvation. You can't bring yourself to Christ. None of it. You were dead. But if you're familiar with the, uh, with the valley of dry bones, what happens? 
Well, Ezekiel prophesies over the dry bones. The, you know, the Spirit of the Lord comes over them. That wind comes and the flesh is going on them. And he says, now prophesy breath. And what ends up standing before him but an army? Even in Ephesians chapter 2, you have, but, uh, but God, being rich in mercy, made you alive together with Christ. That this gospel salvation comes, but it doesn't become because you made a good decision, because you were spiritually sensitive, and it doesn't come because that you figured it out. Look here at verse 13 again. And you being dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him. There is no part of that verse that has anything to do with you, except that you received it. There's nothing here that says, and you made yourself alive because you prayed a sinner's prayer in church one time when you were a little kid, and then you came to the front and signed a piece of paper. It says that he made you alive with Christ, that this is the working of a sovereign God in you. Now, does it, this results in your regeneration. It results in faith. It results in you professing Christ as the true God, man. But it does not mean that you brought yourself there. Because it does, the passages like this don't leave you room for that. They don't leave you room that when you stand you know, on that last day of judgment, and you look over, and here's a man who is to be damned, and here you stand, and they go, and you ask, what's the difference between the two? The answer has nothing to do with you. You don't get to say, well, I made the right decision, and he didn't make it, so I'm just smarter or wiser or more spiritually sensitive or in whatever other way I'm superior to this guy going to hell because I figured it out. It is purely the grace of God poured out onto your life that has regenerated you. Point blank, stop, and there's no other questions about it. It is the grace of God. He made you alive with Christ. See, we've talked a lot in these weeks about the physical resurrection, and praise God that it's true, but there is a resurrection that has already happened in your life, an inward resurrection of the Spirit, where you, have, you were dead and you have been made alive. Now, one day your body will go into the grave, but it will follow your spirit out on that day that Christ comes. You will be resurrected to a physical body, Christian. You will have that. But that is only a reflection of what God has already done inward. It reflects what has already happened inside. He made you alive together with Christ. Verse 14 having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he has also taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So this, that there is this, um, this certificate of debt consisting of decrees. What is this talking about here? Well, quite frankly, this is kind of like, there's, this is a bill. You have an IOU because of your transgressions of decrees. What decrees? The law of God. You have transgressed the law of God. You have fallen short, and there's a penalty due that. There's a penalty that's due temporally, but there's a penalty that's due cosmically. And that penalty is the last death, the eternal death. That is what your transgression of God has earned you. But for those who are in Christ Jesus... That certificate of debt has been canceled out. That God, when, he, we, when we says the, the people of God as the elect sing that, you know, my name was graven on his hands, that he bore my sin, you really mean that. That he particularly went up there to represent you and your sin, your debt was nailed to the cross. Therefore, you owe nothing left. The redemption of Christ accomplished perfectly the salvation for all those whom the Father draws and gives to the Son. John chapter 6. That is what Jesus accomplished. He is not the halfway Savior. He's not the, well, I did my part, now you pick up the rest. He represents perfectly His people throughout history to the Father. And your debt was nailed to the cross in Christ. Verse 15, having disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them in him. Now here we get to the point 
where there's, so if you guys don't get this, this idea of a public display, what's going on here? In the ancient Roman world, or in the ancient world in general, you conquer another people, you conquer an enemy, you take their leaders and you put them in a parade and you march them around and go, see who I just beat up. Like that, that this was a, like super normal. Like, here, I've conquered them. Here's their display. I'm going to take them on a parade now. Look at them. They thought they were big and strong. I handled it. And so here it says Jesus in this same fashion. It's the same kind of language that the ancients would have used. He made a public display of the rulers and the authorities, having disarmed them. And this comes, and this happens on two different levels. This happens on one, the it is the spiritual side of things, where you have Paul in 1 Corinthians saying, Oh, death, where is your sting? Where, like, where, where is the victory anymore? Like, you don't have it. It's been robbed of you. All your power, all your bite is gone because Jesus came out of the grave. Like, you, you don't have it. Anyone who's in Christ, death has no authority anymore. In fact, the death that we die is a blessing from God that we may put away this sinful flesh and one day be raised to a resurrected eternal one. Like, it is a blessing. You will be set free through death rather than death being what leads to your damnation. Like, we can actually, in one, in one sense, look forward as Christians to an anticipation that I will be set free from this sinful body and its groanings and its wicked desires that, you know, as my flesh struggles with my spirit, as Paul says in Romans, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do, and my spirit and my flesh are at war with each other. That day will come to an end because you will go into the ground as a seed, yet you will be raised to life at the harvest. But in this, God has taken those rulers and authorities and he has mocked them by coming out of the grave. He has mocked death. He has mocked any kind of demonic opinion you have. What hold do you have on me? But he also mocked the authorities of this, of this world. The death is still the same thing because, again, who sentenced him to death but the rulers and authorities of this world? Who tried to put him down? Who tried to get him out? They are also mocked by his exit of the grave. They are also put on display. What authority did you think you have over me? Jesus told Pilate, you don't take my life from me. Nobody does. I give it up freely and I'll pick it up again. He showed it to be true. And as one, uh, one quote that I always love when, you know, because the governments, we talked about it last week, the governments of the world have always had an issue, well, specifically the tyrants of this world have always had an issue with Christ because Christ's people don't tend to take to being, a, a, don't take to tyrants well throughout history and have tended to be pretty defiant of them. But if the, if the rulers and authorities, if they didn't want Jesus to be talked about in the public square, they ought not to have crucified him in the public square. Like, they are the ones who took him out there and put him on, dis tried to put him on display, tried to put him to death. And in reality, he rose from the grave. Instead, it's a mockery of them now. And now the cry goes out, submit to the true God and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so in all of this, while it is still today, if for all who is in here, if you are not in Christ, repent today while it is still today. Find forgiveness in Christ Today, the door is open that anyone who would profess Christ as Lord will be saved. That is a promise of God. That all who believe in Christ and confess him as Lord will be saved. And so today, repent and believe the gospel. Now, moving to verses 16 and 17. Now that we got the hot gospel out of the way in the beginning, what does Paul say is the result of that? Therefore, no one is to judge you in food and drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now in this, remember, as we've gone through the book of Colossians, we've taken note of Paul's allusions to the temple that he's been making of Christ as this temple now in the, in the new creation age and his people part of that temple uh, in union with him. 
And when we keep that in mind, you kind of look at these things here and these ideas of food and drink and uh, festivals, new moons, Sabbath days. And I should be clear, what I, because what I think is talking about here is Sabbath days. I don't think it's necessarily talking about the last day of the week. It's not talking about like every Saturday Sabbath, because the Sabbath, I would argue, is a creational reality. So the, re, the, the purpose for the Sabbath, the Sabbath doesn't begin at the law of Moses. The Sabbath precedes Moses because God rested on the last day. The purposes of this were always rooted in creation. So, I, and this is where I am. I am sympathetic to uh, Christian Sabbatarians who see the, uh, the, in the new covenant age that the Sabbath has been renewed, not done away with, and moved to the first day of the week rather than the last, that on the day of the Lord's resurrection is these things. I'm sympathetic to it. There are obviously those who look at a passage like this and would disagree with that. But regardless to say, what I think the Sabbath here is specifically talking about is the idea that there were these specific holy Sabbath days that weren't you know, every Saturday, but they were special times of rest. There are these special interesting that were referred to in this way. But regardless of that, these things all have to do with cleanliness and things to do with the temple. So you can't, if you're, if you're eating unclean food and drink, you can't go into the temple. If you are, you know, where are these uh, festivals and new moons and these specific uh, set-apart Sabbath celebrations taking place but at the temple? Like there's an idea of entrance, I think, even still here in the temple. Now, you have to, now I think it's important to understand that in Greek culture, you still have temples. There are temples to their false gods. There are temples, to the, and there are also mystery cults who kind of have this idea of, again, like secret knowledge, come here, get on the inside. Not everybody knows about this. An idea of uh, spiritual out there in the 39th dimension temples that we're going to get to by you know, different means, whether it be by taking uh, hallucinogenic plants and having things, getting drunk off wine, having these weird you know, experiences. They would enter into these things. And in doing so, they would try to, they would also have these initiation protocols, these ideas of cleanliness and that you have to have going on. And I would think when I see this, it seems to me that this kind of spiritualized temple concept that exists way out there and has nothing to do with what's going on down here. This kind of concept of temple, um, they are latching on now to these, these Greeks that are trying to syncretize with the Christian faith. They are taking their dualism, grabbing on to the old law and saying, okay, to get to this temple, and we see this by the idea of visions of angels, like they're having this, like they're seeing into the other realm, and we're trying to get ourselves there. We're trying to get ourselves outside of here and up into there. We need to grab onto these things so we can make ourselves clean, that we may be initiated, that we may enter in, that we may be a part of it. And remember, that is part of what was going on in the Old Testament. Prior to Christ, there were these cleanliness codes. There were these laws, and they, they established multiple things. But one of them is that you may approach God, that you can come in. But here, Paul makes the point, right, that these things were only a shadow of what is to come. They, Jesus, is the substance. It is in Jesus that these things were pointing to. You don't need these extra layers of cleanliness anymore. You are clean in Christ. You may approach the Holy of Holies in the blood of Christ. You don't need to go through this, these ceremonial aspects anymore. They've been done away with because Christ has made them, or has, uh, has fulfilled them. He has done, he has made them in the ultimate way. These were only meant to show you like, hey, like you need something. And Christ said, now I'm going to do it. You don't have to keep going through the washings. You don't have to even... Uh, Christ said, it's not what goes into a man, but what comes out of a man that defiles him. Like these, these things that they are clinging to, I mean, it's, it's really, it comes down to, like Hebrew says, we have something more glorious now. Why would we go back to the old forms? Like, and we, I can just keep going on this in so many different directions. When I have my wife with me, why would I rather have a picture of my wife? Why would, why would I rather have some kind of 
poem about my wife rather than having my wife. Like, I don't want the shadow. I don't want the representation. I don't want the thing that's kind of like, I want the thing. Christ is it. He is the substance. He is what all the Old Testament, all the prophets, all of Moses and the law was looking forward to. Why turn back? You don't need this anymore. You don't need these ceremonies anymore. They pointed forward to something. They were a tutor. They've instructed and taught you. Look to the substance in Christ. Verse 18. Well, and I, sh- I should say there are modern groups that are doing, there's things like the Hebrew Roots Movement where if you look into it, it's really like, hey, like as Christians, you know, there's Christ, but we shouldn't get rid of all of this law stuff. I could point you to some resources that really go into this, but it, it really is a concept of like, it's, it's in, in a real way, there's like a Judaizing effect that going on and to different levels and we need to be aware of that. Um, Because some people say, some of these people who are kind of doing this, like, well, I don't think you need it to be saved, but I think you should do it. But, I mean, we have the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. We have Paul saying here in Colossians, clear cut. Why are you letting them judge you? Why are you letting them tell you what you can eat and drink? Or that you have to uh, still acknowledge these holy temples? Like, stop. Christ has come. They were meant to point forward to him. Now that he's come, you don't need it. Don't so, verse 18. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self abasement and the worship of the angels, going into detail about visions he has seen, being puffed up for nothing by his fleshly mind. All right, so first of all, what is the prize that's being talked about here? Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize. So in this saying of, hey, you know, this, uh, and they're doing it by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels. So what is going on there? It comes back, right? Uh, no one is to judge you in food and drink or in respect to a new, uh, a new moon or a festival or a Sabbath day. These things are only a shadow. Christ is the substance. So let no one keep defrauding you of your prize. So what is the prize? Well, there's two ways that you can really... Uh, Look at it. One, it would be that it's salvation and eternal life. Now, I kind of made the point as I look at this uh, work that it doesn't seem like this heresy that has crept its way into the early church. It seems to be denying the physicality of Christ, the den- you know, uh, uh, that he was a man. It seems to be, den- and then of uh, promoting these kinds of activities as we just saw in the preceding verse. It doesn't seem to have made strong inroads. In fact, Paul is continually saying how his thankfulness for this church, that the gospel has done a work in them. He's, I mean, he's stoked about it. Um, but, but we do, <clears throat> even though we do have warnings throughout the Testament, it's like, hey, you are in Christ. Don't, you know, don't abandon your first love. Don't do this. Stuff. Like, hold fast to your head, as we'll see here in a second. But this, is, this would be one way to look at it, that salvation is, that this prize is salvation and everlasting life, which by, if you adhere to this heresy, you will have no part in these things. Um, while I think that is true, and I think that's true from a, that's true implied in this, I don't think it's Paul's direct point. I don't think he's directly hitting that. I think that's true as a result of it. Rather, I think the prize is from the context of the epistle. What we've already been going through is that who what do the Colossians have but an inheritance? And what is that inheritance? It is creation and the new creation itself. So when the, and what are these people, uh, what are these heretics doing but saying, hey, don't have any part of the created order. You actually want to escape that. All, all this that's like made and physical, we're trying to get ourselves into the 147th dimension of spirituality that just doesn't actually touch any of this. So you need to be all in self-abasement. You need to just be looking out there, you know, like angels and where they're hanging out out there and doing all that kind of stuff because we don't want anything to do with this. And what are they, and so what then are they doing but robbing the Colossians of their prize for all those who are in Christ that they will be co-heirs with Christ? that there is actually a physical world that you, Christian, have claimed to that is yours. 
It is yours in Christ Jesus to have and enjoy. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, Jesus says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now, we want to be clear here that there's obviously realities where Christians suffer in, the, uh, in this inner Advent age, that we have the time between Christ's first bodily coming and his bodily return at the end of history. And in this in-between, there's going to be hardship and there is going to be suffering. There's going to be hard and difficult things. Yet at the same time, we are told that we are part of a new creation, that where the church is, that new creation, and that this world is yours to inherit. And we've talked about this in past weeks, like it is yours, so do well with it. Do good with it. Uh, Produce good things. And so that even though God does at times... uh, decree hard times for his people that they do have to go through, it doesn't change the reality that he is the giver of good gifts like sunsets and like red meat and like grass under your feet on a cool day. Like like all these beautiful, wonderful things that God has given you to enjoy, a gracious and wonderful God that gives abundantly He does not give shallowly. He gives good gifts and pleasures for his people to enjoy. And this is one of the great psyops that the enemy has run on the people of God, where it's the idea that Satan is the one who gives pleasure and God's stodgy and doesn't want you to have anything that's good and fun. and What a lie. Like Like as if our God who created this world and all that is in it and says, go therefore, take it over, like, I mean, that, that, that was the command to Adam, right? Like, again, bear fruit and multiply. Make it work for you and enjoy it. And we look at it and go, oh, well, no, like, no, like, that's what Satan wants us to do. What a lie. It, and it's the same lie that's going on in the garden where they have the abundance of the entire world, the abundancy of it all. God has spared them nothing except he goes, don't eat of this one tree. And we're still today looking at the thing that like, oh, well, God said, don't do that and obsessing about that when he's given us an abundance of goodness. Like, he has laid it out. I mean, this is, it is such a, ju- I mean, it's even the way like, oh no, like you have all these, you know, hedonists that deny Christ and they're just out there living for pleasure. Have you actually seen the life of a heroin addict who's just seeking the pleasure of heroin? Like, do you think there's an overabundance of pleasure except for that? What is it? They, have, they get a high that enslaves them and destroys their life and robs them of every other good pleasure that God has put into this world. And we go, oh, they're just like, you know, that's Satan giving pleasure to people. It's Satan lying by an, uh, offering an initial pleasure and then destroying someone's life with it and robbing them of all the other all goodness that is in this world. This is no pleasure. This is one of those moments where I think C.S. Lewis had such a good light. He he understood story and therefore understood the world. He understood how things function. He saw them turn. And in the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you have this moment where the white witch as winter's thawing. And like, you know, it's like, oh, summer's coming. There's going to like, you know, like good things are starting to show themselves. She comes across this group of talking beasts that are having a feast. And she's absolutely just like, what are you doing? And lays and like turns them all to stone, like in her fury that they would be feasting and enjoying this goodness that's coming from the thawing of the winter. Now, at the same time, the white witch earlier in the story, if you don't remember, if you've read the books or even seen the movie, she has the moment where the one brother, Edmund, comes. She's like, hey, you want some Turkish delight? Like, here's a treat. Now, if you don't, again, if you don't, if you've only seen the movie, if you haven't seen the books, the books tell, like, you know, C.S. Lewis makes the point, it was an enchanted Turkish delight, and you would keep eating it till it killed you if someone lets you. Like, it, it was meant to, it was a pleasure that was meant to enchant the mind and destroy somebody, not something that was meant to be a good gift to them. And that is really the difference where God is saying, here's the abundance of goodness. I lay it out before you. Use it properly. Use it well. Enjoy. Let no one judge you according to food or drink. This is the fruit of my table. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I give it to you. And then we go, oh, well, God doesn't want me to get drunk. Oh, boo-hoo. 
like something that will just destroy your life. And at the same time, we see in places like Isaiah that God lets out a feast and is like, and, you know, here's the good wine. You know, when you get to... Uh, when you get to the Gospels and you get to John chapter 2 and Jesus makes the wine, and they're like, well, this is the best wine that's been here the whole time. Was it lawful for them to get drunk and abuse that good gift? No, of course it wasn't. But it was a good thing that was meant to be enjoyed in that moment. Did it represent something more? Yes, but it was also a good gift in the moment for these people at this marriage feast saying, like, here, enjoy. Use it properly. And so, Christian, don't let anyone rob you by saying, well, no, you can't have these good things. you gotta, you got to, you know, avoid pleasure because that will make you worldly. No, your Father has given you good gifts. Receive them gratefully and use them lawfully and glorify his name in the enjoyment of the goodness and the overabundance of goodness he has given you. So how they're, again, they're doing this by self-abasement and the visions of angels. Now, the self-abasement is kind of self-explanatory, right? We already get it. We, we've just been talking about it this whole time. Don't, you know, don't touch anything. Like, don't, don't let any of this taint you. Ew, gross, things of the, of the created order. Like, run from them. But then you also have these visions of angels. Now, again, this is just another way of trying to get yourself out of the world that God made. It's trying to get you to run out of this and like, no, 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 just give, always focus on what's out there, never here. Don't, don't let that, uh, and we'll get, and if you're sitting here thinking about the beginning of Colossians chapter 3, well, I'll explain that why what I'm saying there is not contradictory to what Paul says in a few verses later in Colossians chapter 3. But... It's ironic that this mindset that these people have, Paul says they're the ones with the fleshly mindset. They're actually the ones who are behaving carnally. It's not the, Christ, it's not the person who enjoys these things with a grateful heart towards God with the proper disposition. It's the guy who obsesses about them and won't, you know, that's all he thinks about is how he can't have them. That's the carnal one. That's the one with the fleshly mindset. And this tense, fleshly, is again the idea of the fallen flesh that men have after the fall. So, so let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, going into detail about visions he has seen, being puffed up for nothing by his fleshly mind. And verse 19, not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. So this obsession with all these things is taking them away from the head. It's taking them away from Christ in whom they are to be rooted, in whom their life flows from. This... This obsessive running away from the good things that God has made, this focusing on trying to, again, just get, what, what's something that has nothing to do with here, and let me imagine myself getting to some other uh, realm where I don't have to be a part of God's created order where he made me and intended me to be. This obsession is pulling them away from Christ. They are not in union with the temple anymore. There's the ironic when that's the great irony here. That again, Paul's saying that like you guys, you think that there's some temple you're trying to get yourself to. Like, and again, this is the concept of the mystery cult. This is latching itself on to the Old Testament temple ideas. And here Paul goes, no, no, you're actually pulling yourself away from the union for what the, from what the temple represented, Christ. You're actually pulling yourself away from it. You're getting out of it. You're not having anything to do with the true temple. You're not becoming part of that temple of God where the presence of God dwells. You have ran from it. You have made yourself to have nothing to do with it. And the growth that comes in this temple, this temple that is expanding, and this temple that is growing, its growth comes from God. And again, notice that it's not produced by uh, the body, but it's produced by God. Like God gives the growth. It ultimately comes from him. Now verse 20. 
If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees, do not handle, nor taste, nor touch, which deal with everything destined to perish with use, which are in accordance with the commands and teachings of men? Um, now, it's an interesting use of the world, word world there. So, again, if you're in union with Christ, that means you have died with Christ. Uh, Galatians chapter uh, 2, verse 20. Um, whoa, why did, I, why did it just disappear from my head as, soon as, it got, as quickly as it got there? Um, now I've got to turn to it. I haven't had to turn to quote Galatians 2.20 in a long time. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when Paul recognized that if you are in union with Christ, you've been crucified with him. There is that sense, again, you died there at Calvary with Christ. Now, as we saw in previous verses, you've also been made alive with him in his resurrection. So anyone who is with Christ and represented by his death is also made alive with him in his resurrection. But if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of this world, why is if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? Now, there's, what does Paul exactly mean by world here? Well, again, we've kind of talked about this as we've gone through the work of creation, or, or the work, this epistle of Colossians, that we have this, uh, we have laid out for us that there's two creations, right? There's an old creation and there's a new creation. And the old is being done away with, and the new is being made to be consummated at the return of Christ. Now, in this, the old, what I think Paul, when he's talking about the world here, again, he's talking about this old created order, this order that before Christ came, this order before where, yes, there was these cleanliness laws. There were these things you had to abide by, but they ended when Christ came inaugurating the new creation. He puts these away. We don't live in the same world anymore as people lived in before the incarnation. The cosmos shifted at the moment of the incarnation. Nothing ever to be the same. And so now the new creation has begun. It exists in the people of God and all, everywhere they go. And it will reach its ultimate consummation at the return of Christ. So Paul is asking these people, you who say you are part of this new creation order, you yourself have been made a new creation, and that's what Paul calls believers in other places in the New Testament. You who are a new creation, who lives in the new creation, why are you living like you're still part of the old creation? Why do you live like things are still back there? They're not. We're, we've moved past it. Why are you letting them tell you, do not handle nor taste or touch if you've died to those things? You're not under it anymore. You're, that's not your concern. These things are dealing with everything that is to perish with use, which are in accordance with the commands and teaching of men. Verse 23, which are matters having to be sure a word of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So all this stuff, Paul goes, yeah, it seems like it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But it does you absolutely no good. It benefits you nothing. Like all this, I'm going to deny myself all these good things and enjoyable things, and I'm not going to take part of them. All that is these things that are completely lawful for me. I'm not going to touch them, though, because I don't want to get locked up in this. No good for you. It doesn't even stem your fleshly indulgence. This is one of the things I, if you, uh, if you want to talk about this, I really don't like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and the way that they work themselves, because it's completely contrary to the gospel. It is completely contrary to the gospel. The idea being that you have these people who are going to an AA meeting, they haven't had a drink in 30 years, and they come up and like, hi, I'm Joey and I'm an alcoholic. You haven't had a drink in 30 years and you're an alcoholic? Well, it's a disease. I thought it was just called being a drunk. I mean, when I read the Bible, 
Like, I thought it was just sin. It was sin that was put to death in the person of Christ, and you can be set free from it. Why are you identifying, but that's all they have? Because once you're doing this apart from Christ, you're still a slave to this stuff. Just because you're denying it, you're still enslaved to it. You're set free from nothing. Like, it's, it's, you're still 40 years later in bondage going, oh, well, you know, I'm Joey and I'm an alcoholic. Because there's no freedom. There's nothing. The, the, the idea is just like, well, I'm just going to deny myself and I'm going to fake it till I make it and just one day at a time. And Jesus says, come be set free. Like, this isn't about self-abasement. This isn't about denying yourself something. It's about coming to Christ, being set free, and then you may use all things lawfully in Christ Jesus because you are a new creation, because you're being sanctified. Now, I do want to be careful here because someone may take my words and say, so you're telling us that we all need to go have a glass of wine? No, I'm not telling you you need to go have a glass of wine after service. I'm simply saying there are things that are lawful for you. They are free to you. And just by saying, well, I'm not going to have it, doesn't benefit you anything. It doesn't actually do you any good just to say, well, I'm going to deny myself something, something that's a good gift from God, and like it's going to make me closer to him. No, it's not. It's not going to make you any closer. It's, not, it's going to do none of these things for you. Rather, just come to Christ, be set free, and glory in his good gifts, and partake of them as you desire. Just use them lawfully. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you that we may come to, come to them and see your character revealed and your will for your people and how we are to conduct ourselves in this present age. Father, may we be, again be conformed more and more into the image of your son. Anything that was spoken from this pulpit that was from you this morning, Lord, let it take root in our hearts and transform us and sanctify us. But if anything that was said here was not from you, may it be forgotten. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you for the word and for the songs that glorify you and minister to our hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're moving to time now for observe, observing the Lord's Supper. Going through the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter is addressed to believers. He sets the stage and gives a setting of Christ's observance of the Passover meal with the disciples. Paul lets us know when this was by stating that it was the night in which he was betrayed, that was integral to what Christ was revealing through this, this time. Yes, I know I was speaking directly of Judas, but prior to the Lord working in our hearts and redeeming us, we're in the same place. We're against, we've rejected Christ, we've denied Paul's letter in 1 Timothy speaks, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent op opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed with me with, with love and faith that are in Christ Jesus. This, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. We come together this Lord's Day as Christ's body, as, as the church, as believers in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member of this local church, but as Paul was addressing the, Christ, the believers in Corinth, you do have to be a believer. Otherwise, this time we spend before the Lord's table means nothing to you. In fact, you're just making a mockery of it. This is for believers and no one else. In 1 Corinthians 11.27, Paul gives this warning. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. 
indicates that we must take a, examine ourselves prior to taking part in this observance of the Lord's table. We are to examine ourselves. If there's, if we're harboring known sin or in opposition to someone else should abstain from taking part of that and, and spend the time in prayer to our Lord. In 1 Corinthians 11.26, we continue. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves right, truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with, with the world. Let's just take a few moments in silent prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we pray for forgiveness, for cleansing. There's nothing that we can offer you in and of ourselves as of any value whatsoever. And that is like as filthy rags, Lord. Lord, but you are, you are faithful. You are a forgiving God. We thank you, Lord, for that work that you've done in our hearts. Pray that you continue to Mold us, conform us more into the image of Christ. And we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. I've asked Joe to assist with us. Uh, we'll, we'll come forward in a few minutes. There's two cups stacked together. Make sure you take both of them. And then return to your seats and we'll observe the rest of the Lord's Supper. If there's anyone here that uh, would like them taken back to you, just raise your hand. Joe will bring the elements back to you. So let's let's come forward now and partake of